Clapton, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, and Pete Townsend. All of them were born around the same time, 1944, 1945. All of them live within close proximity to one another. If they wanted to do a jam session, they would have to drive for about 20 minutes somewhere in this area, right here. Where is it? Yeah, right here. Um, and they would do a jam session. So that's fascinating to me. How many of you play guitar? One? Just one? Well, two. All right. Um, this is fascinating to me, guys. There's been amazing, innovative, not just great guitar players, but innovative great guitar players before this crop of guitar gods. Charlie Christian, uh, Django Reinhardt, even Ike Turner has innovated of Tina, Ike and Tina fame, right? Has innovated guitar as an instrument in, in great ways. Uh, you familiar with these guys? Django Reinhardt, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there's been amazingly great and innovative guitar players before them, right? And there's been amazingly innovative guitar players afterwards, right? Stanley Jordan, the guy that plays guitar like this. Amazing. Tom Morello, Rage Against the Machine. That guy doesn't get enough credit for innovating the instrument. Who else can you think of that's been really innovative? Right? There's been a lot of people who have been uh, amazingly innovative and great guitar players, and yet none of them are guitar gods. When I say guitar god, you don't think Tom Morello. You don't think Car Charlie Christian. You think who? You th <laughs> pun not intended. You think Eric Clapton. You think Jimmy Page, Led Zeppelin, right? Pete Townsend, The Who. You think Jeff Beck. These are bona fide guitar guys. The only outlier in this bunch may be Jimi Hendrix. Until you realize, even though Jimi was born stateside, he launched his guitar god career in London. Chad Chadwick of the Animals, right? He was his manager, right? Around the same time. This is very fascinating to me. They were the same age. They were in the same place, right? What happened here? What happened here is they caught the wave, right? Prior to this time, right, uh, in the uh, post-World War II, uh, early 1940s, mid-1940s, early 50s, right, there were all these black blues guitarists recording uh, uh, stuff uh, stateside. Uh, those records eventually made their way into England, right? These guys, growing up as teenagers, picked up these records, they listened to them, they imitated those records, um, and then the record industry in England matured to the point where they started exporting their content into this newfound market, the United States. And these guys rode the wave into guitar god stardom because they were at the right place in the right time. I'll do you one better. I can go to any city USA and find thousand guitar players who are objectively better than any one of these four. And 500 of them are going to be delivering pizza, the other 500 will be delivering weed. What's going on? There was a wave and these guys caught it. Here's another wave. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. Both were born in 1955. And if you guys recognize uh, uh, Leo Bosak and Sandy Lerner, uh, they, they are the couple founders of Cisco. And I don't know if you're familiar with Cisco, but those blue links boxes that connect you to the interwebs and the Twitters, right? Uh, uh, they make those, right? They own those. Uh, Cisco owns the network infrastructure that we use to connect to Facebook and so on, right? Uh, and Larry Elson, do you guys know who Larry Elson is? He's the founder of Oracle. So this is again something very interesting and peculiar, right? All of them West Coast. Granted Bill Gates is up in Seattle, right? But that's a, a day's drive down to 
uh, this area, which I sort of blew up over here because it's so tightly packed, right? Palo Alto and uh, that whole uh, bit, right? Where these other three have, um, you know, started their companies. So uh, Bill Gates founded Microsoft in 1975. Uh, Steve Jobs founded Apple in 1976, right? Um, Larry Ellison, slightly older than Bill and uh, Steve, slightly older. In fact, Larry Ellison was a mentor to Steve Jobs for much of his career, right? Um, he founded Oracle in 1977, pretty much same time as Apple and Microsoft, right? Um, when, when these guys founded uh, 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 Microsoft and Apple, personal computers were standalone machines. They didn't connect to anything, right? But all of a sudden, this data warehouse was available to ordinary folks at a high price point, I'll grant you, right? And there was a need to store and manage all this information. And that's where Larry Ellison came in with Oracle. It's a data management software, platform, Oracle, right? Uh, came in around the same time. Now, it may seem like Cisco started out a little bit late, 1984, but it didn't, right? It, it started right on time because personal computers started sprouting out everywhere. They were standalone boxes, but then there was a need for the two of us, you on one side of the university, me on the other, to connect and talk to one another. And in order for, uh, for that to happen, we need some kind of connection. And that's where Cisco developed devices called routers. And if any of you are network engineering geeks, I am. But um, it was right on time. What I'm trying to say here is there was a wave of personal computing. There was a wave and these guys caught it. If you developed a personal computer in 1965, you would be about 10 years too early. If you try to get into personal computing business right now, competing with Windows and Apple OS, you'd be too late. In fact, if we look at Linux, how many of you use Linux? Right? Linux was developed in early 1990s by Linus Torvalds in, help me out, he's somewhere in Scandinavia, I forget. Um, but uh, he, he got in and developed Linux, which is arguably a better operating system than Apple or Windows. But look, in this room, there's like two or three people that have barely used it. There was a wave. These guys caught it. If you didn't catch it, it's too late. Okay. So that was the first part about perfect waves. Next up, I want to talk about perfect circles. If you're lucky in your life, you will read a few, maybe three or four or five books that will change everything uh, for you. They will change the way you see everything. If you're lucky, you're going to read a few of those books, right? One such book for me is this book. It's called The Dictator's Handbook. It's, by, uh, it's written by a dude named Bruce Bueno de Mesquita. I'm probably butchering his name, right? But he's a professor at NYU. Uh, he's um, some kind of factor at Stanford. Uh, he's been studying uh, social sciences and political sciences for over 20 years. He, uh, you know, he's in charge of various think tanks and whatever. He comes with credentials is what I'm trying to say, right? wrote this book, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, it, change, it will change everything for you. So this book does something very extraordinary and very original. It looks at political systems, not political systems in a obvious narrow sense, right? But political systems in a very general broad sense, in a kind of political system where we're all doing politics all the time. Right? There's politics in this school happening right now. There are politics at your company happening right now. You see what I'm saying? There's politics at any level of government, even within families. There are certain kind of politics that are happening, right? So when people talk about politics, it's very easy to 
Discuss politics in terms of what is the political structure. Is it a democracy, autocracy, um, a monarchy, a dictatorship, so on and so forth. And it's a very obvious to break it up. That's not what the author did. What the author did is he broke it up into circles. Three circles to be specific. There is the inner circle, right? This is the seat of the power. There's the inner circle. There is the circle around it, which is the circle of the essentials. The essentials are the ones that keep the inner circle in power. And then beyond the essentials circle, there's the circle of non-essentials. Depending on the size of each of these circles, it very reliably, without fail, across types of governments, democracy, monarchy, whatever, uh, and across time, it predicts what the environment, what the living conditions are going to be for non-essentials. So let me give you an example. Saudi Arabia, right? Very resource rich, uh, very tight, small inner circle, right? Um, royal family, essentially, right? The essentials are essentially those who keep the inner circle in power. The police, the, the army, right? The government bureaucrats uh, and enforcers of whatever sort, right? And then you have this very large circle of non-essentials, people of Saudi Arabia, which live in absolute poverty. Right? Contrast that with something like United States. Sure, the economy is bad and whatnot, right? But look at the non-essentials. Us. Right? We are the non-essentials. Um, we all have cell phones. We're all using laptops. We all have three square meals a day. We all go to a warm house and, and uh, sleep in a warm bed. Compared to people, non-essentials, in Saudi Arabia, we got it pretty good. Why? Because the inner circle, the president's cabinet, the three branches of the government, the various uh, you know, government officials or whatever, it's a very large and distributed inner circle. right? Uh, and then you have the circle of essentials. Again, the army, the you know, police, the people uh, uh, that keep the inner circle in power. Um, and that's also very large and very distributed. And then you have non-essentials, the rest of us, that's also very large, right? So if you look at any kind of political system, in a broad sense of that word, right? You look at the sizes of the inner circle, the essentials and the non-essentials, and you will be pretty well able to predict the conditions that non-essentials are living in. So we started with waves, then we talked about circles, now I want to talk about Greek gods. All right, That's Zeus, obviously, with his pantheon of gods, right? Okay, how many of you have seen the uh, Wrath of Titans? Anyone? I have three people, four, nice, awesome, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so you don't have to be familiar with Greek mythology. Um, if you've seen Wrath of Tit Titans, you're ready for this. So, um, in the movie, uh, there's a scene where uh, they explain why gods of Olympus lost their power. Zeus and the rest of the uh, pantheon of gods, they lost their power. This is taken straight from Greek mythology, right? They lost their power because people stopped praying to them. That's a powerful concept, man. Right? They try to teach us. Right? We just need to generalize these principles across various disciplines. Right? It's a powerful concept. Think about it. Right? Take anything that's in power right now and stop paying attention to it and it will go away. A TV station, Fox News as an example. You stop watching it, all of us collectively stop watching Fox News right now, it's going to go away. Political parties. You stop paying attention to your political parties, they'll go away. 
Your church. You stop going to church, to your church or any church, right? Make sure no one goes to that church and it will go away. That's a very powerful concept. When you stop paying attention to something, it loses power over you. Conversely, when you are paying attention to something, it has power over you. At least to some extent. So we talked about perfect waves, we talked about circles, and we talked about this idea of not paying attention to the gods, rather paying attention laterally, if you will. Okay, now, you may be wondering, what the heck is this dude talking about? Uh, Greek gods and guitar gods and all of that stuff, right? What has this got to do with content marketing? Well, here we are. You're late. You're late. You and I are late. Like guitar gods in 1960s, like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, the personal computer wave, right? Like all of those things, there was a time to get in, and if you didn't get in when the time was right, you're late. You and I are late. Let's take a cross section of top 100 internet properties, right? Here they are. And let's see when they, when they were born. If you look at a, a cross-section of top 100 internet properties, you're going to find something peculiar. They were all born around the same time. TechCrunch, 2005. Mashable in Huffington Post, Lifehacker, same thing. Read, write, web, a little bit earlier, right? Jezebel, 2007. Gizmodo, 2002. Twitter, 2006. SlideShare, 2006. Early to mid-2000s. Uh, there was a wave. If you were there to catch that wave, you caught it. Right? Even stupid ideas like SlideShare. I mean, why do I want to watch somebody's PowerPoint presentation? How excited? It's, it's dumb. Right? Even SlideShare uh, has managed to, you know, survive and thrive because it started at the right time. I mean, how ridiculous of an idea is that? Am I the only one on this? How many of you look at PowerPoint presentations? It's barely interesting when there's a person talking about it. You know what I mean? Twitter, 2006. If Twitter, a lot of people said when Twitter first came out that Twitter is stupid. Twitter is pointless. If Twitter um, came into existence two years earlier, those people would have been proven wrong. If Twitter came into existence today, it wouldn't stand a chance. There's a bunch of Twitter similar knockoffs or whatever out there. They're not doing anything. I can't name one. I know they exist, but I can't name one. Can you? Guys, there was a time to get in. That time has passed. So you guys have an uphill battle. This is that inner circle essentials and not essentials that I talked about earlier. Right? The point is, um, there is already an inner circle online and we are not in it. Guys that work for TechCrunch and Read Write Web and all those guys, Technorati and whatnot. Um, those guys are in the inner circle. We are not. All right? We're not even in the circle of essentials. We are way out in the frontier. Right? There's you know, famous uh, stuff out there with the dude that founded is it Read Write Web, um, featuring startups that he invested in. So like blatant um, uh, you know, ethical violations. You know, you invest in a startup, then you write about it on your site, and the startup blows up. Right? Inner Circle can do this. We can't. All right? So this is what uh, all those circles look like right now. 
All those big sites are in the inner circle. They, uh, they command disproportionate amount of attention from us. All of you have been to at least some of these sites, right? They command disproportionate amount of attention. Anytime we contribute content to one of these sites, whether it's an actual article or a comment, we squeak into the circle of the essentials because we are supporting their structure. What we're really doing is building um, their empires with our bricks. All right? Anytime you share their stuff, what you're really saying, hey, friends on Facebook, uh, you should go pay attention to the inner circle over here. And guys, make no mistake, we're living in attention economy. Attention is the precursor to money. Okay? You want to make money anywhere in life? You're going to need attention of somebody. Right? These guys command disproportionate amount of attention online, and we are supporting them. Right? We are essentially, I don't know if you guys can tell what this is, we're just switches. We're just on and off. When you go to a site and you like something, what you're doing is you're letting Facebook know that, hey, you should send me advertisements about this stuff in the future. Here, build up my profile so you can advertise to me better. Right? I don't want to get off on a tangent, but I just wanted to do that. Okay. In 1970s, uh, Ed DeBono um, published a book called Lateral Thinking. 1980s, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi published a book called uh, Creativity. Um, a few years ago, Stephen Johnson published a book called Where Good Ideas Come From. Um, I highly recommend all three of those books, by the way. Uh, Stephen Johnson's book, Where Good Ideas Come From, uh, is a great and easy read. Uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi's book on creativity is just the source um, for scientific research and all that stuff uh, in terms of creativity. Uh, and Ed DeBono is a little clinical and academic, but uh, still a great read. Uh, so I highly recommend all three of those books. Uh, but what I'm trying to uh, illustrate is that for a few decades now, there's been ample research, scientific research, into where creativity comes from, right? What does it take to be creative, right? Um, so one of the most important pillars of creativity is biodiversity. Right? And when I say biodiversity, I'm talking about, um, you know, look at us right here. We come from various backgrounds. We come from various cultures. Uh, we come from, uh, we, we're in different age groups. There's a lot of biodiversity in this room alone, right? And that's one of the principles of creativity because each of us can bring a different point of view on whatever it is that we're trying to create, right? Um, that's one of the pillars. The other pillar that's sort of implied is this peer-to-peer -peer relationship, right? Wherever there was an explosion of creativity, from like ancient Greek times, 500 BC, Athens, Greece, right? To like 17th century Italy, where there was a, you know, a kind of a huge renaissance or whatever, to today's Brooklyn. There's a, uh, there's a huge biodiversity of people working laterally, peer to peer, right? So you want to spur creativity, right? You want to create something. This is what you're looking for. You're looking for biodiversity and you, you're looking for creativity. Uh, you're looking for peer to peer relationship, okay? That's really, you know, the three books summarized. Um, so, I could have come here and said, Triber is a content distribution platform, right? And it would sound like any old, you know, use my tool pitch type of deal, right? Um, so, I knew you guys were a little smarter than the average bear, so I figured, let me bring my A game, all right? Um, 
So I wanted to talk to you about circles, waves, and this lateral relationship. All right? So Triber is a content distribution platform, right? Um, we're too late to catch the perfect wave. We're late. But imagine if all of us were in a tribe on Triber. All of us have small, tiny audiences on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, of our own. And every time I publish something, all of you can automatically, semi-automatically, or manually share it across multiple networks. We call it the reach multiply, right? Where Mark alone can share it on both Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, G+, whatever, right? Right? Now imagine if 30 of, a, of you shared my content like that. Now imagine when you publish a blog post and the rest of us do the same. You just created your own wave. It's about that tier one, the inner circle, right? Creating an inner circle of like-minded individuals um, uh, with the same or similar goals. Uh, with the uh, um, uh, same or similar audience and whatnot, um, when we tribe up together and you help me share my content, I help you share yours, you manage to create a tiny little wave of your own, right? And that little initial burst may be enough for it to catch fire, right? Because then my audience may reshare your post and her audience may reshare the post, and his audience may reshare the post, and so on and so forth. But that initial inner circle, you're building the inner circle of supporters. We all need it, right? We're just not intuitively doing it online. We have it in real life. We have inner circles in real life. Your family is the first one, right? So we need that inner circle. It helps you create a wave. Right? And then the other thing, and this is probably the thing that I'm most proud of when it comes to Triber, is um, funny things, uh, we don't tell people to do this, well I do, but generally speaking we don't tell people on Triber to do this, it just happens. They stop paying attention to the gods of the blogosphere. And they start looking laterally. So. Triber is built with these mechanics in mind, right? Um, ability to create an inner circle. Ability for that inner circle to distribute your content, right? Create a kind of a wave. And then to stop looking up and start looking laterally. And we don't necessarily tell you to do any of this stuff. I'm here explaining the philosophical approach to building Triber here to you guys, right? But we don't do that when you join the site, right? It's kind of like going uh, on a um, 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 water slide, you know, uh, when you're like 10 years old. Nobody tells you how to go down a water slide. The environment instructs you how to go down a water slide, right? So that's what we do with Triber. We let the environment instruct you to create an inner circle, to create a perfect wave, right? And to look laterally instead of up to the gods of the blogosphere, right? Because if we stop paying attention to them, and the attention is the finite resource. That is the one finite resource that matters. If we steal attention from them and distribute it amongst ourselves, We'll be all right. All right? So that is the uh, philosophical ap approach to building Triber. That's what we're doing. Uh, what this does in a grander scheme of things, it, it creates many distributed inner circles. Right? Kind of like the inner circle uh, of U.S. government and so on. Right? And it accomplishes the same thing. It accomplishes a thing to have this, um, you know, essentials and non-essentials become a kind of a large and relatively wealthy 
middle class, right? Uh, all the economists and all the politicians are always talking about middle class. The reason they talk about middle class is that they are the middle class. Whenever you have few rich and many poor, the poor are always oppressed, right? Um, or there's all kinds of instability because the poor riot. That's just the way human nature works, right? Um, online right now, we have few rich and many poor. If we create a large middle class online, middle class in any society has always been found to be tolerant, um, um, educated, uh, enlightened, all these good things that we all really want um, for the society. So my hope, my personal hope, is that if we can do this online, we might be able to accomplish this offline as well. So that is the philosophical approach to building Triber. I hope, if you guys have a blog, I certainly hope you will check it out uh, and uh, you know, join the fight.